Steph, whenever you're ready. Your name is on the screen. Daryl? Good morning and welcome. Welcome to the second plenary of People Power Impact, the Future of Immigration. I know that you've all been in workshops this morning. Over a hundred of you joined the wellness session at around 8.30. Yesterday's plenary was on fire and we expect the exact same thing to be happening today. This has been a tremendously successful conference and now we have even more for you as our panel are waiting. But before I introduce you to our panel for this morning, some housekeeping. Um, let me introduce myself first. So those of you who may not know me, my name is Debbie Douglas, and I'm the Executive Director of OCASI. Um, the, the conference is being conducted in both official language. At the bottom right hand of your screen, you will see the interpretation button. Please press on that and choose your language of choice. We are aware that some of you have experience um, some issues on Feedloop with the French channel. If you are continuing to have problems this morning, please click on experiencing issues. Click here for additional live stream options. This can be found below the viewing window. If you're still having issues, then please contact Stephanie Brown through the private message on your Feedloop. We want to hear from you and engage with you. So if you have questions for the panelists, please use your Q&A, which is in the bottom of your screen, um, second from left on my screen. I'm assuming it's the same on most people's screen. Um, and ask your questions there. Um, the moderator and I, Madeline Narenberg and I will be paying attention um, and we will be getting you engaged in the conversation as we move along. The future of, of immigration. I'm joining you today from Toronto, uh, Treaty 13 territory and the District One Spoon Wampum Belt uh, Agreement between the Haudenosaunee and other nations and the Mississaugas of the Credit to care for the lands around the Great Lakes. The future of immigration. Immigration has long been regarded as critical to Canada's population growth and economic prosperity and it is expected to be central to Canada's post-pandemic economic recovery. While annual immigration targets are now substantially increased, Canada also persists in growing its temporary migration programs, bringing in massive numbers of temporary workers and international students. Within the country, immigrants continue to face systemic barriers to getting decent work and re-entering their professions. Immigrants and refugees face a troubled and challenging settlement process at times. Panelists will bring their experience and insights to this discussion on the future of immigration. It's a dynamic panel, I'm telling you people. So let me introduce to you our panel moderator, Madeline Narenberg. Madeline is the manager responsible for newcomer services at Keys Job Center. She oversees creative, culturally competent, and solution-focused employment, language, and resettlement services for newcomers in the Kingston district and area. Madeline emphasizes a feminist, anti-racist, anti-oppressive, trauma-informed, and strengths-based approach to client services. She has championed the development of innovative quality services for newcomers in the Kingston area and is grateful to work and learn every day with a wonderful community of staff, volunteers, participants, and partners. Madeline, the floor is yours. Good after, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Debbie, for having, um, having me and for hosting this, uh, this conference. It's so, Wonderful to have the opportunity to be engaged in an online format. And I'm pleased to be with you in my own office, in my uh, office in Kingston, the traditional territory of Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and other Indigenous peoples, um, where I, I live as an uninvited guest. 
um, in the in the hopes to have good relations with the indigenous people of this land. I'm so pleased to be moderating this panel on the future of immigration. Debbie has set the stage a little bit for us. In order to, to look forward, I think we also need to look back at, and we don't have very far back to look to see that we are in a moment of tremendous change as it pertains to our economic context, to the experience of newcomers, migrants and refugees in our communities and to policies that impact um, immigrants and, and those of us, like all of you, who seek to serve them and, and support them in their journeys. So I don't wanna say much more because we have a very uh, knowledgeable panel who's going to share their, their insights. And so just to let you know how this panel is going to work, each of the five panelists will have a few minutes to share their initial comments. And then we're gonna go into a Q&A section. I have a series of questions that I'm gonna start with and invite uh, a few panelists to comment on each question. And then I'm gonna be looking for your questions. So like Debbie said, please use the Q&A, ask your questions. You can ask them in English or in French. And um, I, you, you don't have the opportunity to stand at the mic, uh, but I will be your mic and I will pass them on to the, to the panelists. So our, our panelists for today are Ethel Tungohan, Carl Flecker, Ken Nakahara, Michael Jasek, and Naomi Alboy. And we're gonna hear first from Naomi. Naomi is a senior policy fellow at the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration at Ryerson University and a distinguished fellow at the School of Policy Studies at Queen's University. She has taught graduate level courses on Canadian immigration and refugee policy for the past 20 years and has written extensively on the topic. Ms. Alboim is an active public policy consultant and has advised governments and NGOs across Canada, Europe, the Caribbean, Vietnam, Indonesia, Ghana, Kenya, and South Korea. Previously, Ms. Alboim worked at senior levels in the Canadian, federal, and Ontario provincial governments for 25 years including eight years as deputy minister in three different portfolios. Her areas of responsibility included immigration, human rights, labor market training, workplace standards, culture, as well as women's, seniors, disability, and indigenous issues. Naomi is a recipient of Queen Elizabeth II's gold and diamond jubilee medals and is a member of the Order of Ontario. Thank you, Naomi, for joining us and over to you. Thanks, Mad. <clears throat> thanks, Madeline. I just had to unmute myself. Um, thanks very much for having invited me to um, uh, to the conference, and um, it's always a pleasure to be here. I wish I could see some of the faces uh, directly, but um, it's um, I'm feeling you out there, if not seeing you out there. So, um, first of all, I'm not going to go over a lot of ground that you already know, but just to um, to emphasize the fact that it's clear for so many reasons uh, that we need immigration now and we will continue to need uh, immigration and more of it going forward. And this is for all kinds of reasons, our declining birth rates, the aging of our population, labor shortages, skill shortages, declining populations in certain parts of the country, the need to maintain and grow francophone populations outside of Quebec, and to maintain our leadership role in refugee resettlement in face of ever-growing needs. The question is, do our current immigration policies need tweaking or more significant rethinking, given what we know now in 2021 and in order to be ready for the future? I will pose 10 questions um, rather than suggest solutions, and I'm going to do that in very quick order. So question number one, do we need to rethink our notion of only bringing in permanent economic immigrants with high human capital and relying on increasing numbers of temporary workers to do essential work at other points of the labor market continuum? Number two, should there be more pathways to permanent residence for temporary workers working in differently skilled occupations? 
Number three, can we simplify our immigration programs and processes to make them more transparent, accessible, efficient, and effective? Number four, if pilot programs are deemed successful, why are they not mainstreamed? Number five, how do we ensure that the immigrants we select are able to fully use their skills rather than being underemployed? Number six, how do we attract and most importantly retain immigrants in communities across the country? Number seven, do the three distinct categories of economic, family, and refugee streams still make sense? For example, should there be a refugee family reunification program with a broader definition of family? Should economic immigrants with family connections in smaller communities be given priority given the implications for retention? Should refugees with agricultural experiences be settled in clusters in rural areas to participate in our essential food producing labor force rather than relying on vulnerable temporary workers? Number eight, do we need to rethink our refugee resettlement programs to ensure that all refugees benefit from both the expertise of our settlement sector and the wraparound support, friendship, and citizen engagement of private sponsors? Number nine, can we build supporting refugees into Canadians' DNA on an ongoing basis rather than only responding to crises that make the headlines and reinventing the wheel for every new refugee movement. And 10, how do we really address the systemic barriers and racism faced by so many temporary entrants, immigrants, and racialized citizens in Canada? I suggest it's important for us to discuss these and other big questions so that we have an immigration program that prepares us for the future. I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Naomi. Next, we are going to hear from Ken Nakahara, who is the Assistant Deputy Minister of the Global Talent and Settlement Services Division at the Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development. In his role, Ken leads Ontario's immigration policy Newcomer Settlement Services, Bridge Training, and Provincial Immigrant Nominee Programs. Prior to this, Ken has held several leadership roles in the Ontario Public Service, leading a number of key energy policy initiatives, including Ontario's 20-year long-term energy plan, the development of a $1.2 billion energy conservation framework, and the settlement of a historic grievance with a First Nation community. Ken has an MBA degree from the Schulich School of Business and a science degree from the University of Toronto. Welcome, Ken, over to you. Great, thanks, thanks very much, Madeline. Good morning, everyone. A pleasure to be here. And I'm, I don't think I've ever previously addressed <clears throat> such a large contingent of settlement service providers. So this feels like a, a, a big deal for me. So thank you to Debbie for the invitation. Um, and, and it's particularly meaningful, and I'll state the obvious here, because without the work of all of you individually and collective, Ontario would not be the welcoming province that it is. So thank you for all your efforts. Um, I say that both as an immigrant and uh, within the context of the role I hold in the Ontario Public Service. So I'd like to take this moment to give you a little bit of explanation about our uh, immigration team at this ministry, it's Global Talent and Settlement Services Division, because we're fairly new. We were started a few months ago as the government brought together a, a various immigration policies and functions under one roof. And so there are uh, three key areas of this team. The first is the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which gives the province the chance to strategically select economic immigrants uh, that meet this uh, province's labor market needs. The second is immigration policy, which is fairly far reaching and it gives us uh, the chance to interact with all kinds of ministries within the government and with our federal colleagues on matters that range from refugees to economic immigration and so forth. And the third is settlement services, which you're uh, of course very familiar with. So those are the three key areas. 
And bringing them all together uh, has been very exciting because it gives us a chance to look at things holistically the way that you might as you're interacting with immigrants uh, on a day-to-day -day basis rather than as we used to on an individual file specific basis. And in terms of um, things that are priorities for us, I wanted to mention three of them just to give you a bit of sense of what we've been focusing on and happy to answer any questions in the Q&A session on these. The first is, you know, back to the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program. We think that the province should be able to select a lot more than just the fraction of, of economic immigrants that it currently selects. So we've been advocating to the federal government to grow the program so that we can reflect the variety of economic opportunities in Ontario. And the federal selection is excellent at choosing high human capital individuals that do well in, in particular sectors that are important to Ontario, but the Ontario economy is broader than that. And the provincial nominee program is one avenue that we think we can reflect that diversity of opportunities, regional needs, and so forth. At the same time, we've also been improving the program through the introduction of our expression of interest system earlier this year, which lets us be a lot more strategic about selecting people for our high, vol high volume, uh, our really popular streams. The second has been on foreign credential um, recognition. And so yesterday, the government announced its intention to introduce legislation, which if passed, would help the government remove barriers to highly skilled foreign um, trained immigrants who want to practice here in Ontario. And, and, and in that respect, I'm very grateful for the feedback we got from Debbie and many of you here on this call as we were holding consultation sessions earlier this year with the Ontario Fairness Commissioner. That input, that guidance was very instructive to us as we were trying to give advice to government who was pushing us to find um, meaningful ways to address these longstanding barriers. And the third priority is on settlement services. Um, we launched a call for proposals uh, about eight weeks ago, and we just closed it on Monday, um, setting up a new five-year funding framework that uh, builds on the success of that uh, program stream, uh, opens up the language training to more providers, puts more emphasis on the economic aspects of settlement services, while still maintaining the, the holistic view of what immigrants need to, to uh, do well in integrating into the Ontario society and economy. And, 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 that's been, and that's been another sort of focal area. So it's been a busy six months and I'm very grateful for, for my team there for having taken on this work. Um, and I'll close by saying that these kinds of discussions are very important to us as we think about what to focus next on. And so looking forward to the, the Q&A session and discussion that's to come. Thanks, Madeline. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, we're now gonna hear from Dr. Ethel Tongohan, who is a Canada Research Chair in Canadian Migration, Policy, Impacts and Activism, and an Associate Professor of Politics in York, at York University. Her research examines immigration policy with a specific focus on temporary labor migration policy, as well as migrant advocacy. She's written widely on immigration related issues and has testified in the Canadian House of Commons on needed changes to temporary labor migration policies. So glad to have you. Uh, please, please over to you, Ethel. Thank you so much, Madeline. Uh, it is such an honor to be on this panel today. Uh, thank you, Debbie, for the invitation. So when thinking about the future of immigration in Canada, I immediately think of whether this future will lead to the continued vulnerability of precarious migrants. I am worried that the future of Canadian immigration will continue devaluing so-called low-skilled and unskilled migrant labor. I am concerned that the entrenchment of two-step immigration processes where migrants have to enter Canada through one immigration program first before trying to get permanent residency through another pathway will heighten migrant vulnerability. The bulk of my work looks at the effects of these policies and programs on the lived realities of migrants. And as we talk about the future of immigration, I really want to emphasize that we have to think about the fact that policies have effects on the lives of people. One of my projects over the last few years involves examining the evolution of Canada's migrant worker programs. One immediate trend that I've noticed is that despite attempts to create so-called pathways to permanent residency for temporary migrants, these pathways are actually very limited. 
Take, for example, the experiences of migrant care workers. During the pandemic, there was a lot of discourses about how migrant care workers' labor is absolutely essential to Canada, that they are heroes who Canada relies on to survive the pandemic. Yet what I am witnessing is that there are more requirements for migrant care workers, including IELTS tests and credential assessment requirements, making it harder for migrant care workers to get permanent residency. So I ask, if migrant care workers specifically and migrant workers' labor is really so essential, then why do we still have these very onerous requirements? Previous versions of the migrant care worker program, such as the Living Caregiver Program, did not have these requirements. Another thing that I am hearing about and that's emerging from my research is that there almost seems to be last minute programs being put into place to provide pathways to PR. This can be seen in what I would argue is the notorious TR to PR pathway, uh, which encouraged people to apply even if they haven't met say language requirements because people were worried that they would lose their chance. Uh, the audience members here must have talked about this program in great detail, and I look forward to learning more from you about your experiences. But long story short, my research reveals that this program probably wasn't as well thought out as migrants would like. Uh, I work closely with international students, with migrant care workers, and other labor migrants, all of whom have mentioned many hoops that they've had to jump through to try to attain permanent residency. So as I contemplate the future of immigration in Canada, I wonder the extent to which Canada will continue to be reliant on two-step immigration processes, on temporary labor migration programs, and what these processes and programs mean for the lives of migrants, potential migrants, and their families. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ethel. Um, so we've got, we've got two more panelists, and next we're gonna be hearing from Michael Jasek who is a senior advisor responsible for immigration, education, social, social and health policy portfolios with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. Prior to joining the AMO, Michael worked for the City of Toronto in a variety of capacities, managing intergovernmental relations, corporate governance projects and homelessness programs. Michael also formally worked for Citizenship and Immigration Canada managing federal settlement and resettlement programs for immigrants and refugees in communities across Ontario. Welcome, Michael, and over to you. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Okazi uh, for providing me the opportunity to speak to you on this panel today. I'm honored to be alongside some distinguished uh, panelists and uh, do value the uh, relationship with Okazi. I am pleased to be here as a representative of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, or AMO for short. Uh, and as such, I'll be speaking a little bit to you today about the municipal perspective. Uh, and uh, to provide a, in my opening remarks, I'll be providing a little bit of context about the interest and role uh, of municipalities in shaping the role, uh, the future of immigration. Uh, first of all, a little bit about my organization uh, for your information. Uh, AMO is a nonpartisan association uh, that acts as a voice for municipal governments in, in Ontario, uh, much like Okazi does for the settlement sector. Uh, we work to address common challenges and improve the quality of life for residents, uh, primarily through advocacy to the provincial and federal governments. Our members are the cities, towns, villages, regions and counties which you live and work in. Uh, these municipalities all have an interest in immigration and successful settlement. Uh, AMO over the years has consistently positioned immigration as essential for economic prosperity and growth. Uh, Municipalities value uh, immigration as it contributes to workforce and economic development. Uh, it's also a rich source of uh, diversity and helps communities grow, especially where populations are aging and declining. Uh, and it also provides opportunities to contribute to Canada's humanitarian commitments uh, to welcome and resettle refugees. So I'll talk a little bit about the municipal role. Um, as you may know, under the Canadian Constitution, immigration and settlement are a shared federal and uh, provincial responsibility. However, uh, it's critically important to acknowledge that uh, newcomers intersect with municipal services upon arrival uh, in Canada. Uh, this includes services that you know, such as public transit, libraries, public health, and parks and recreation, uh, to name a few. Uh, and most of what municipalities provide to their residents uh, helps address the social determinants of health uh, for people. Uh, we know this is essential for successful settlement and for social inclusion. 
Uh, and I believe that this underscores the important work that your settlement agencies do to help immigrants and refugees to access uh, municipal services. As we know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has taken a toll. Um, it's disrupted immigration and had an impact on immigrants, refugees, and uh, migrant workers. Uh, AMO has been working with the provincial and federal governments to promote uh, social and economic recovery, um, including immigration. We've been providing input into federal and provincial decisions that impact people and communities. Uh, this examples include investments in transit, housing, child care, and public health services. Uh, we do believe in collaboration between governments and community partnerships to work together to address common challenges. Uh, there is a forum for uh, policy discussion between governments uh, through the Municipal Immigration Committee, which is comprised of municipal, federal, and provincial government representatives. Uh, and uh, this forum does allow us to talk about the design and implementation of uh, new, uh, new initiatives. Uh, and it's important for AMO to have a seat at this table when determining immigration and uh, settlement policies, uh, and we have been able to achieve this. So uh, that's just a little context about the municipal interest and role to uh, set the stage for further conversation. Uh, I do look forward to the panel discussion today and sharing more thoughts on the future of uh, immigration. Uh, thank you, and uh, back to you, Madeline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. So we're, we're going to hear now from Carl Flecker, who's currently a senior manager responsible for policy and advocacy with West World Education Services, who strive for the just and equitable integration of newcomers into the Canadian labor force. Carl has extensive experience in the fields of labor migration, human rights, and anti-racism. He has worked with non-governmental and community-based organizations, research and policy institutes, the Canadian labor movement, academia, and government. In 2019-2020, he and his partner, Wendy, volunteered in Myanmar with civil society organizations pursuing democratic and economic policy changes. They also dodged week-long water festivals that involved some questionable water sources, poisonous snakes, landslides, extensive flooding, COVID, and a military coup. Don't know if we're gonna be hearing about that today, but I know, um, Carl has some remarks for us now. So over to you, Carl. Thank you, Madeline. And thank you, Okasi and fellow panelists. It really is a pleasure to be here. And a big thanks for everybody to take time out of your day um, to be participating here. Uh, I'm standing, sitting is the new smoking. I would encourage you at some point in the next time that minutes that you're here to stretch and move around a little bit. Uh, one quick input that I wanted to pick up on Naomi's 10th question. In 2019, the People's Party of Canada, PPC, I don't think somebody really thought through that acronym. It had a membership base of just 40,000 people. By 2021, they attracted roughly 800,000 votes. This is not a party that favors immigration. Their platform included this statement. Immigration policy, quote, should not be used to forcibly change the cultural character and social fabric of our country. Specifics in their platform promises included substantially lowering intake levels, 100 to 150,000 a year, focusing on economic immigrants with the right skills, accepting fewer refugees, limiting family reunification, closing the door for grandparents, making birth tourism illegal, values testing of each and every newcomer, and beefing up spending for CSIS, the RCMP, and IRCC to do background checks. Nearly a million voters ticked the PPC box on election day. Yeah, they didn't win any seats in parliament, but this electoral result is worrisome for the future of inclusive, progressive, decent, honorable immigration policies. On a personal level, perhaps you saw PPC signs in your neighborhood. I did. And I still feel deeply troubled at the boldness and the proximity. What does this election result signal for parliamentarians who are looking for support from nearly a million xenophobes? Perhaps the future of immigration policy and those of us in the business of valuing immigration must confront the conditions that have allowed, enabled these points of view 
this level of prominence. When I think about the future of immigration, I think it would be a grave mistake to underestimate the corrupting and violent implications of this development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. And thank you to all of the panelists for your opening remarks. We've set the stage with um, such a broad variety of issues that we know impact immigrants in our communities, those of us who work with, with newcomers and what we see in the, the future coming. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the breadth of issues that, that, that have been shared from, you know, what is policy changes, what policy changes need to happen to the rise of xenophobia, to recognizing um, the issues that impact vulnerable migrants and the, the, the catch 22 of being considered essential while, while being kept out of permanent residence and to all the changes that are happening at the provincial level. I know, I think we're all familiar with the CFP that closed on, on Monday, Ken, um, and to the role of municipalities. As, as Michael was speaking about the important role that municipal, municipalities have in terms of the well-being of newcomers, I was thinking about the impacts of COVID on, on issues of isolation and connection um, and how that that's continuing and municipalities have such a, a central role. So I want to I want to move in now, uh, though, to some, some questions so we can hear more from the panelists. Um, and and as you are listening, as you have questions, you can start typing them in to the Q&A and we'll be getting to them. So so my first question is for Ethel and Michael. Um, we know that uh, Canadian workforce challenges have long been a driver of immigration policy. How do you see that, that fact impacting migrants and communities as we move into the future? And can I pass it to you first, Ethel, for, for your thoughts? Thank you so much. I think the, well, <laughs> in uh, my circles among um, immigration researchers, we see the growing reliance um, on, on workforce, challenge, workforce challenges as being part and parcel of the growing marketization of immigration policy. Um, I think one of the biggest concerns that uh, other immigration researchers and advocates have shared is that this means that um, we don't actually have a chance to intervene as much, we being members of the public, uh, when it comes to decision making. Uh, a geography professor, Dan Hebert at UBC says that uh, the centralization of such decision making and tying it into uh, workplace needs actually comes with significant significant political implications. Um, I think based on my own work, I worry that tying in a labor market success and using that as one of the key determinants for who gets to immigrate to Canada uh, might actually lead to more abuse of migrant workers, right? Because as people try to get a foothold to greater stability in Canada, they become more hold in to potential sponsors and to potential employers. So when it comes to the lived experiences that I've heard about, I am a little bit concerned about these trends as well. And I'll end by saying that, you know, when it comes to kind of the history of Canada as a nation, um, I worry that, you know, if we tie it too much or solely or primarily to labor market participation, then we're kind of missing other aspects of what makes Canada an immigrant receiving country, right? Michael, would you like to share your, your thoughts on this? Sure, absolutely. Um, so uh, I, I agree that uh, workforce challenges have been and continue to be a key driver of immigration policy. Um, Amos certainly holds that immigration will be at the forefront of our future economic uh, sustainability. Um, it doesn't need to be the, uh, the, the only driver. However, we uh, do believe in a balanced uh, immigration system that uh, um, uh, prioritizes uh, different things. but. Municipal governments are looking forward to immigration to fill labor shortages in Ontario. Um, and this is especially true in rural and northern Ontario, uh, in those areas where there's a, an acute need for workers, uh, both skilled and unskilled, low skilled, sorry. Um, these municipalities are actively trying to attract and retain new workers. Uh, they're trying to do this through innovative and creative ways to demonstrate the uh, opportunities in their communities. Um, and it's critical for Ontario to receive new immigrants, uh, but uh, for AMO and our municipal members, it's equally as important that the benefits of immigration 
are dispersed to all regions across the province uh, through the offering of uh, different opportunities in the different communities. Um, and this can be done in various ways that uh, governments can help facilitate. Um, AMO is certainly supportive of initiatives in the federal and provincial governments that aim to help attract immigrants to live throughout Ontario. Uh, one is the Government of Canada's Rural and Northern Immigration Pilot, which is in place in several uh, northern communities. There is also the Provincial Regional Immigration Pilot of the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program, uh, and this serves rural, small, and medium-sized communities, um, all currently in uh, southern Ontario. Uh, AIM was also quite interested in the potential of a municipal nominee program. Uh, this was a plan of the federal government that would provide municipal governments with more uh, influence over the uh, selection of uh, immigrants. Um, details have not been released. Uh, I think it's been in the works since 2019 when it was in the minister's mandate letter. Uh, we are unsure of the status though, uh, as it did not come up uh, as a commitment during the uh, recent federal election campaign. So, but we do look forward to learning more about uh, government plans uh, regarding this. Uh, so the implications for people and communities um, is that we may be seeing more immigration to more and different places. Um, I think that uh, newcomers will need to be welcomed by their host communities. Welcoming communities are very important. Uh, settlement services will also need to be available uh, where they are lacking. Uh, newcomers must also be able to live affordable, affordably. Um, housing, childcare, and other supports must be within reach for newcomers. Um, and I believe this is all important to attract and retain new immigrants uh, in Ontario. Uh, thank you for the question. Thank you, Michael. Would any other panelists like to comment on this question before we move on to the next one? Naomi, please. <clears throat> um, I, I think it is a, um, a fact um, that um, the economic benefits of immigration are very significant and um, the economic benefits of immigration, uh, I think, um, have been basically accepted by the general uh, population. Um, I think that the, the question that I have is whether we are looking at the full gamut of our economic needs or whether we have gotten really stuck on only the high human capital needs of the country. And I think that we are ignoring, I mean, we learned so much from COVID, unfortunately, about what essential work really is. And a lot of the essential work was not in the high human capital areas. So I think we have to recalibrate our immigration program to be, I think it's good if, our, if at least part of our immigration program is responsive to economic needs, labor market needs, um, that not only helps a country, but it, but it does provide widespread support for immigration to allow um, other streams to actually also be acceptable to the general public, like the refugee stream and the family stream. So I think the economic stream is terribly important, but it cannot be purely focused on one end of the continuum, ignoring our very legitimate real needs at all other points of the continuum. And I think going forward, a lot of the jobs that require human capital, we have learned through COVID, can be done remotely. But you need a plumber to fix your sink in your house. That can't be done remotely. And you need someone to take care of your children in your house, not remotely. Um, so I think we have to recalibrate um, how our economic program actually works. Thank you, Naomi. And, and as we look at, you know, I would add that as we look at the understand and more fully appreciate all the economic benefits of, of immigration, we also need to make sure that those benefits are accrued to all migrants <laughs> and immigrants within within our borders. So, so Carl, please, um, you had some inputs as well. Yeah, I would just uh, echo, I think, what Naomi and others might be thinking, you know, immigration policy needs to think about nation building and what does that look like to build a nation on communities, not just GDP. And I think one thing that the pandemic has taught us is that while money is really necessary, community is much more powerful in the long term. 
Thank you. Thank you. If I, can just, I just want to add one more thing in terms of nation building. I think we really run the risk if we continue going the way we're going of um, sort of reinforcing the notion of um, um, good jobs go to permanent people. Jobs uh, that nobody else wants to go to, temp to do goes to temporary people. And we have a bifurcated society rather than um, a nation that is um, where we see all of us as us rather than um, we and them. Thank you. Uh, I want to I want to switch to a slightly different topic to, to continue touching on all the edges of the, the breadth of this issue. Um, you know, about 15 years ago, the province of Ontario passed legislation to ensure fair access to professions. And we know that immigrant professionals still face nearly insurmountable barriers to to accessing their regulated occupations, whether in healthcare um, or, or outside of the healthcare sector. So, so what can be done about this? Um, and I'm, I'm hoping Ken and Carl um, can speak to that and, and maybe Ken to you first. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank, thanks so much. And <clears throat> I'll use the opportunity to maybe expand a little bit on what I was mentioning before about this uh, proposed legislation, but, but absolutely agreed with the, with the idea that it, uh, it needs attention. And in my own extended family, I have people who <clears throat> were trained overseas, came here to Canada, couldn't practice, and and uh, you know had the the difficulties that we hear about in terms of the lack of Canadian experience, <clears throat> but the the, the 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 lack of opportunity to get that Canadian experience and the catch twenty two that that creates, long timelines for registration costs. Um, through the consultation sessions that we heard we had earlier this year, we heard about uh, multiple language tests that people would have to go through. Again, adding to the, the burden on the individual. So so this uh, proposed um, legislation. So this legislation, which um, if passed, uh, would, would um, create the, the, the mechanism for government to work with the regulators to start to address some of these things. So on Canadian experience, um, giving the government the chance to remove that requirement unless it's there for very specific health and safety reasons. And so having the regulators figure out other ways to assess a Canadian specific context to whatever the professional uh, experience needs to be. And, and we've seen some regulators do this and some others not quite get there yet. So just giving ourselves the ability to um, be a bit more um, compelling with regulators on that front. On, on language testing, we would need to work with uh, regulators again, but also with federal colleagues to figure out if, if someone comes in and has to do English or French language testing, um, let's not make them do it two or three times again as they go through a different regulatory process. There may be professional specific language that needs to be um, tested, but that doesn't necessarily need to be an entire uh, testing framework the way we have right now. Um, there are also uh, timelines that, that I think people find uh, unrealistic or un unreasonable in terms of uh, people who have to wait a lot longer than, than, than they might have to, to find out if they are um, uh, eligible to be credentialed in, in the Ontario profession. So. Um, giving the, the government the opportunity to hold regulators to a certain standard, um, and, and this might differ by regulator, regular to regulator, so we need to get into discussions with them to find out what is, the, what is the context for these current timelines, what are the pinch points, how can we be creative about getting to uh, faster outcomes, and, and in this way kind of move, move forward on these things. So they're not, none of them are like easy solution, but with the proposed legislation, it would give government additional tools to move forward. So I'll pause there to give uh, a chance for follow-up questions as well. Carl, your, your thoughts on Yeah, thank you, Matt. You know, the, the proposed uh, legislative changes to eliminate the requirements for Canadian experience in non-health professions and trades, reducing the costly duplication of testing and speeding up the registration process. Such measures, if meaningfully implemented, do have the potential to move newcomers more quickly into their fields in Ontario. All good steps, overdue, of course. It's interesting that the pandemic has been a tragic motivator to do the correct thing. Well, kind of. 
The intent to propose legislation says it would not apply to regulated health professionals, though there is the possibility of the proposed changes being applied. It's a might, maybe, we'll explore it kind of thingy. See the last bullet in the quick facts section of the news release. But legislative changes that squarely focus on ensuring that public health and safety concerns are protected by focusing on the required competencies and knowledge to do the job, rather than Canadian experience, would be an important change. It'll also be important for us to monitor the rollout of the proposed legislation, specifically when the news release says that exemptions could be permitted based on, quote, demonstrated public health and safety risks. Will that exemption clause give regulators room to maintain elements of the status quo? And that raises another broader question or concern. Are the skills, talents, and expertise of those internationally trained only most useful when our needs are in the extreme, a la a pandemic? What about the newcomers' needs to be able to re-enter their professions in a timely and fair manner? Should a sustained public health care crisis be the primary driver for inclusive or fair access to professions and trades? Well, frankly, apparently not, because the proposal to introduce legislative changes is clear that it does not yet include regulated health professions. And I find that odd because the second to last bullet in the press release says that, quote, allowing faster registration will be sought when there are emergencies, such as a pandemic, except if you're trained in a regulated health profession. So I'm not so sure that having quicker access to individuals in non-health regulated professions, like getting a quickie with a lawyer or an accountant or an engineer or an electrician or a plumbie would be on the top of my mind in the pandemic era, but it has been a crazy couple of years. But let's get to what more can be done. Creating a national framework for systems-wide changes in the problem patches of immigration, licensure, and equitable inclusive employment standards is needed. There needs to be a sea change in the levels of political will, and this approach to get there is going to need a multi-stakeholder orientation where players are focused on scalable solutions. Now, that's the big picture, but here's just a random series of uh, closer-to-the-ground ideas. Dedicated internet portals that provide concise and easily accessible information about recognition possibilities and procedures. See what they do in Germany. Harmonization policies amongst the varied and numerous institutional stakeholders can help make the assessment process more transparent and accessible. Denmark and the Netherlands have some good practices. How about establishing maximum processing time limits for regulatory bodies to assess international credentials? In Denmark, it's 30 days for uncomplicated cases. How about providing online counseling as well as information on the recognition procedure for non-regulated professions and embed that service provision requirement into national laws as they do in Germany? They also have legally defined time limits for the credential recognition process, generally three months. France and Sweden conduct assessments of international qualifications and competencies of newly arrived immigrants as well as an integral component of their orientation programs. Improving access and direct financial supports for career laddering bridging programs is essential. Manitoba's taken steps in that direction. What about navigation hubs that support newcomers with clear, accessible, and consistent information on licensure, registration, and career laddering and bridging that could erase the maze that currently traps many? Now, some of you may recall the efforts of the Pan-Canadian Framework for the Assessment and Recognition of Foreign Credentials, which that described the ideal steps and processes that governments should follow for successful labor market integration. Four principles in that agreement, fairness, transparency, timeless, timeliness, and consistency. Problem, the framework is not a legal framework. It's just a best of intentions approach. So now nearly 15 years since the Ontario Fairness Commission was struck and suggesting that policy approaches that rely on good intentions, maybe that just doesn't cut it anymore. When there is a demonstrable need that the impacts for newcomers has to be that they can continue in their careers efficaciously and that the public well-being is, is assured. My last input on this, the Fairness Commission has a monitoring support and compliance role with regulatory bodies. These bodies can face reviews and audits. Compliance failures can result in financial penalties for up to $100,000. 
I found this very nuanced line last night in the 2019-2020 Ontario Fairness Commission's annual report. I thought it was interesting. Historically, the level of compliance with fair access legislation varies across professions, end quote. Perhaps after nearly 15 years of limited progress to realize fairness, it's time to re-examine if the stick is big enough and it, perhaps it should be used with more vigor. Madeline, maybe, maybe I can respond to some of Carl's comments. They were excellent, ex excellent uh, set of comments, Carl. So yes, thank you for, for pointing out this was for non-health professions. So the legislation, uh, far pacta uh, that uh, that is within sort of the the mandate of, of my ministry uh, deals with non-health re regulation non-health professions and that's the focus of this uh, proposed legislation and we have been working very closely with the fairness commissioner on all these points and you're right on the health profession side more work needs to be done so there is uh, discussions with between us and the ministry of health to understand you know where they might want to go on, on these very same issues uh, with different kind of regulatory bodies, different regulatory structure and so forth. You're also right that uh, we need a, I think you call it a multi-stakeholder approach. So I think it's great that Ontario is stepping forward, but my hope is that other provinces will see what we're doing, start to pick up the phone, call us, and we'll have good discussions on a multi-provincial approach that might uh, kind of knit us together and with federal colleagues, figure out how to do this uh, on a more Canadian basis, because we've seen other jurisdictions like Australia, different, different legislative and regulatory structure, but have a lot more success than we have in terms of addressing these issues. And in terms of, um, uh, I also wanted to raise bridge training. We have a bridge training program that has recently um, awarded a three-year contract. So the other side of this coin is you can use legislation to address sort of the, the, the systemic barriers that need to be addressed, but there needs to be on the ground assistance today for people that are going through these issues. Um, I also like your comment about information flows that you need to get more information out there to foreign nationals about ways to, to um, maneuver through what can sometimes be a complex pathway of uh, regulatory uh, approaches. So uh, I'll give you a call later so we can call, uh, discuss more in detail, but uh, just some of my, my comments in, in response. Thank you, Ken. Before we move on, would any of the other panelists like to, to comment on uh, fair access to regulated professions? Naomi. Um, I agree absolutely with, with um, what has been um, uh, spoken about. Um, I think, though, that we have to go beyond the regulators. Um, unfortunately, um, there was research that, that showed that even when people are registered or licensed to practice in their occupations, um, they are still not getting the job offers and they're still being underemployed. And um, I think we really have to address that issue about the employer role and um, what needs to be done to not only change employer attitudes about internationally trained professionals, um, but their behavior uh, about internationally trained professionals. Um, and the same with unions, frankly. I mean, I think we really do have to make sure that uh, labor is on board and labor is part of the solution. Um, and the educational institutions. I mean, the bridge training programs um, are really good, but they are, you know, few and far between in some occupations in some communities. Um, I think we have to look at getting all educational institutions to look at this population group as a potential, um, really important client group of their institutions, and come up with um, very, you know, short uh, training programs that don't require them to um, um, commit a long period of time to. Um, you know, uh, increasing their this or, or getting a Canadian credential to demonstrate that they have uh, the skills required to, to do the job and maybe um, uh, they can come up with um, uh, more and um, shorter uh, bridging programs that really focus in specifically on the gaps um, that, uh, that people need. And laddering, I think we have to really look at those I mean, I'll, I'll use a health example, but um, how do people get from PSWs to RNAs to RNs to, 
nurse practitioners uh, to physicians if they in fact were physicians and are now working as a PSW. Um, I mean, the laddering between the, the professions is really um, uh, important and um, um, I think we, we need to focus on those kinds of initiatives. So I'll stop there. Thank you, and and I, I want to I want to share that you know we're getting a lot of comments in the in the chat and the Q and A on on this topic, and I think that that's because you know those of us that work in settlement organizations are facing these issues every day the the frustration the the cost the demoralization you know and some of the comments um, are are concerning you know comments of concern that the new legislation doesn't include. Um, or the proposed legislation rather doesn't include healthcare professions and that that's a very urgent issue and that you know legislation seems to be responding to the needs of you know government or the needs of the, the labor market and that you know the needs of immigrant professionals themselves should also be a core concern and, and driver of change so i think ken you you can realize that we're all watching very intently what changes are are, are um are, are coming and that, you know, you have access to an incredibly knowledgeable sector that I think can share all the challenges that need to be addressed and probably lots of great suggestions for solutions as, as Carl shared. So we look forward to further um, opportunities to, to share our input. Um, I'm gonna go to one more, one more um, scripted question and then we've had some great questions in the Q&A and I don't wanna ignore them all. So um, uh, this is for, for Naomi and Michael and anyone else who would like to, to answer. So in the recent election, the, the Liberal Party announced that if elected, they would commit to resettling 40,000 Afghans. Now Afghans have started to arrive, and we know that close to 80% plan to stay in Ontario. What should we be doing to effectively support this population? How does it impact settlement services, and how does it impact our communities? Naomi, would you like to speak first? Um, first of all, I don't think we, we should assume um, that um, currently and going forward, that ratio will continue. I think that people are um, in the Government of Canada and certainly in the RAP organizations across the country, the 34 RAP organizations across the country, there is a real interest in um, seeing people resettled across the country and not just in Ontario. So I think that, and the first group that came in did have connections to Ontario, many of them did. Um, I'm not sure that we should assume that um, uh, future um, um, entrants, uh, future Afghan refugees will all uh, want to remain in Ontario in that proportion or frankly will allow to be, to, uh, to stay in Ontario if there isn't a family connection or a good reason for them to stay. Um, now I'm not into coercion and I think that people should have, you know, the right um, uh, to settle where they want to settle. Um, on the other hand, people are not necessarily making those decisions in the most informed way. Uh, they don't know what's available across the country. They don't know what opportunities there are, either in terms of housing or in terms of employment or in terms of community welcoming. Um, and I think that um, uh, people need to be provided with more information to, be, to make those um, informed um, uh, choices. But we're already seeing some flights not coming to Pearson but going directly to Calgary. And we are already seeing, you know, whole clusters of people, um, a whole school of girls <clears throat> being settled in Saskatoon, in Saskatchewan. Um, I think the federal government has acknowledged that sending people in large enough clusters to create some kind of um, community that integrates into a broader community as a community really makes a difference in terms of good settlement and, um, uh, and uh, retention. And I, I think that the expectation is that at least the GARs will be settled across the country in 34 communities. And I think the RAP organizations are ready for them and want to uh, receive them in all those 34 communities right across the country. I'm not sure when sponsorship is actually going to become available. 
uh, for this particular refugee movement. Um, there are lots of questions about um, the sponsorship agreement holders and the numbers that they are allowed to um, uh, sponsor and the compliance framework that they, they have to uh, follow. Groups of five still can only sponsor people who have already been determined to be refugees. That's a real barrier for the Afghan uh, refugee population. So unless those things are changed, I think we're going to be seeing in the short term more and more GARs and um, not as many PSRs as um, uh, initially expected. Um, if that opens up, PSRs go everywhere and PSRs go wherever the sponsors are and there is a far broader distribution of PSRs across the country than there are uh, GARs. But ultimately, housing and jobs will be key. And aside from the family connections, uh, which are really important for us to honor um, when in, in refugee choices, I think um, refugees will make decisions uh, based on information about where will they and their children do best. And um, housing and jobs uh, will be key, as well as a welcoming community um, in those communities across the country. And um, incorporating the existing, small but existing Afghan community already here in Canada, um, who are not just in Toronto, but are, are not just in Ontario, into the resettlement efforts um, will make a big difference. So I'll stop there. Michael. Yes. Um, so I think as we anticipate the resettlement of the Afghans, uh, I believe it will be important to build on the success and the lessons learned uh, from previous refugee resettlement movements, um, uh, at the efforts to, to resettle large movements. Uh, and I would probably point to the Syrian refugee movement. Uh, municipal governments were very active in contributing to this resettlement of the refugees from Syria. Uh, we saw a great deal of community mobilization to support the new arrivals. Uh, in many places, political leaders and administrators took initiative and became directly involved in resettlement efforts. Uh, municipal councils were engaged with refugee issues. Uh, and I believe the result was strengthened working relationships between municipal governments and other sector partners, including settlement agencies, the provincial and federal uh, governments, and the community. Um, overall, to be successful, I think there's the need to overcome the challenge uh, with many people arriving in a short period of time. And I don't think we can understate the importance of uh, Good, good advanced planning. Uh, the process begins with the reception and housing of refugees and communities, and this will be challenging given the uh, high cost of rental housing. Um, and a truly successful resettlement process will mean that refugees are going to need the access to community and health and uh, services, as well as employment opportunities uh, over the long term. Uh, in terms of planning, I know local immigration partnership councils in many cases were invaluable to assisting local planning efforts and they could again uh, play a role. Um, the provincial government engaged stakeholders and uh, including municipal governments through a, a, a variety of different forms and working groups and we had regular calls. Uh, and I think there were a number of useful measures that were put into place by uh, municipalities including things like community task force and working groups. Uh, and one other one that I would have mentioned is that, um, you know, there, there was some media engagement and public communications about the issue that uh, I believe likely resulted in increases in private sponsorships, uh, donations, and, and volunteers. And I think that was a joint effort between municipalities uh, and community. Um, so just sort of in closing, um, again, along the planning theme, I think what's needed to help prepare on the ground in the communities uh, from a municipal perspective uh, is... Uh, uh, communication about the flow of arrivals, uh, the numbers and the timing, um, any information on the profile of the movement to assess needs before arrival, uh, real-time reporting on secondary migration between communities, uh, and also I, I believe that there needs to be capacity assessments of local communities to determine the optimal number of refugees that can be successfully supported to become housed and, uh, and resettled. Uh, it remains to be seen what role the municipal governments will play with this time round as we welcome the Afghans to Ontario, but uh, collaboration and partnerships uh, will be essential and learning from this previous experience and ultimately good planning will lead to successful resettlement, uh, I, I would uh, emphasize again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, 
Are there any other panelists who would like to speak to the, the Afghan resettlement? Yeah, Carl. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I certainly understand the immediacy of, of settlement in terms of the survival needs of the Afghani community here. And at some point, I think we'll need to take a step back and think about medium to longer term supportive measures. And I'm thinking of this and, and reflecting on my experience having spent a year in Myanmar and the necessity to be able to find ways and means to support those communities that remain in a country under a new administration. And I'm, I'm suggesting that the link between the immigration settlement sector and foreign policy, you know, where are the opportunities for more Canadians to understand how the Taliban will rule? What are the human rights implications? What are the gender implications? And how can we promote a better understanding of what that is going to look like and involve the Afghani voices who are going to be here in Canada and that and support the Afghani voices and the nationals who are in the country? Um, and where are those points for, for diplomatic and peaceful engagement? to be able to result in the right or the better outcome. Tough, tough stuff ahead, but it can't stop just at settlement. Thank you. I know that um, one of the big issues, of course, as, as Naomi mentioned and, and Michael with, with the settlement side is housing. And there was a, a question to the panelists from, from our audience about housing, which is, you know, what, what policy mechanisms can there be um, to promote or to ensure uh, newcomers and immigrants have access to affordable housing? So oh, turning that question to the, the panelists, what, what policy would you implement to ensure newcomers and immigrants have access to affordable housing? I can take a stab at that if you'd like. So, um, yeah, in terms of um, affordable housing, um, you know, this is a, there's a real crisis in Ontario uh, of affordability and a general lack of supply. Uh, it's been estimated that the province is going to need about 1 million new homes within the next 10 years, and much of that is going to be fueled by the demand, uh, you know, from immigration and also migration uh, from, from other provinces. Um, Municipalities play a key role in affordable housing. Um, unlike other provinces and territories, we have responsibility for community and social housing uh, in our communities and also uh, working with homelessness uh, prevention programs. Um, in terms of the policies, uh, we, um, I think municipalities are working uh, with the provincial government on how to overcome challenges with creating new supply uh, in, in, in the province of Ontario. Um, we think that there's probably going to be the solution lies in a combination of new private market housing but also uh, non-profit municipal and cooperative housing uh, and um, you know generally this is going to require investments from municipal federal and provincial governments uh, and uh, the national housing strategy from the federal government I think is a really good platform to have these discussions uh, we are looking forward to the throne speech um, from the new federal government uh, to get a sense of uh, what commitments they're going to make. They made a number of commitments to new housing during the election campaign, so we would be looking to work with them, you know, for that. But I, I think ultimately it's a, there's a, a mixture of non-financial and financial investment measures that are needed to increase the supply of housing. But uh, I think this is something that's definitely top of mind for municipal, federal, and provincial governments. Madeline, can I answer as well? I think, uh, so I, in partnership with uh, the Alberta uh, Workers Association and Migrante Canada, uh, we conducted a study looking at precarious migrants' access to housing. The report is called Precarious Migrants, Precarious Housing. And I think the key thing to remember is that uh, when it comes to immigrants, migrants, and newcomers' housing needs, a lot of this is kind of under the radar when it comes to policymakers, especially since uh, in terms of the migrants that we talk to, uh, 
people tend to kind of couch surf or they tend to rely on community networks to provide them with, with spaces in their houses. And quite frankly, when we were talking to municipal policymakers uh, about the findings of our study, some people were surprised thinking that, oh, is this really an issue that migrants face? And I think it's important to recognize as well that a lot of the problems are structural too, and that there's housing-based discrimination on the basis of race. And some of the requirements being set uh, for newcomers are simply difficult for newcomers to fulfill. So for instance, uh, you know, we had many narratives from newcomers saying that some of their potential landlords ask for references, not just, you know, in Canada, but in the province of Ontario as well, right? Uh, some, one, some landlords have also asked, uh, you know, would you be able to supply you know, a year's rent in advance for us to hold the space. All of these policies are not obviously, you know, legal, right? But if you're put in a situation where you're desperate for housing, then you probably have to comply with that as well, right? So it's a combination of a few factors based on our on the findings of our report. Um, but I do think, I do want to emphasize that the problem is intensely structural. And uh, thinking back to uh, Carl and Naomi's comments, you also have to look at race and how race is also an impediment for a lot of newcomers when it comes to accessing housing. May I also mm -hmm. jump in here, Madeline? Absolutely. So I don't have any policy recommendations. I think it's probably outside my area of expertise and, and panel members here know more uh, than I do. But I, I just want to reflect on, on our regional pilot for the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program. So that's ending this year. <clears throat> it was a two-year pilot. We're working with three communities. But what I really want to reflect on is as we were trying to choose the specific communities we might work on, <clears throat> we went to, we traveled to over a dozen uh, small, medium-sized community in Southern Ontario. And housing was definitely an issue that came up again and again in terms of um, a concern for the communities themselves in terms of working with us on the pilot basis. So it really emphasized to me that issue, but also the, the issue of partnerships. So a program like the OMP can help direct uh, immigrants with job offers to certain locations, but the actual <clears throat> retention of those individuals, the quality of life of those individuals uh, depends a lot on the municipal partners, the local immigration partnerships, the whole community itself, as a matter of fact. So <clears throat> really need to um, think about that because as this pilot is coming to an end, we're not going to go and choose another three communities to do another pilot. What we really want to do is use the learnings to transform the program to be more regionally responsive. So we're going to butt up against this housing issue. Another one was transportation, where if you don't own a car and if you're on a, on a lower income uh, spectrum than, than otherwise you may not, <clears throat> the public transportation infrastructure is not out there. <clears throat> so um, so definitely need to get more thinking on that front. And just very quickly on the on the sort of um, <clears throat> racial discrimination front of housing, the I didn't spend any time talking about it, but the whole kind of anti-racism lens to immigration is something that I'm very keen to explore. <clears throat> We've been focusing on other things the first six months, but there is something in the government called the anti-racism directorate. And we've been starting to talk to them about just putting an immigration lens on some of their work and figuring out, you know, where can we be helpful in terms of addressing some of these things with partner ministries, with stakeholders outside the government. So just want to you know, note that. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, can I just uh, jump in here? Um, um, I think that the um, supply issue is a huge issue and really does need um, a kind of... Um, uh, a big um, uh, response uh, probably at all levels of government in terms of regulation and in terms of funding and in terms of enforcement of regulation and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I do think that um, uh, there is a, an immediate issue and um, uh, that can be at least partially addressed for the refugees that are coming in now. Um, and that is that the wrap allowance for shelter um, is just woefully out of date and woefully inadequate. Um, and um, that has to be changed. And whether and, and it's interesting because the only way some families are now finding accommodation is because they have lots of kids. And it's not because they're finding bigger places. It's because they have the child benefit. And the money that they're getting for their kids is helping them survive in terms of the rent that they pay. 
um, but if it was just the wrap allowance, they certainly wouldn't be able to afford accommodation. So I think some immediate changes have to be done there. Um, and I would say also that, um, um, and you have to be careful, obviously, not to pit one population group to another population group. Um, but there are, you know, um, uh, federated appeals across the country for um, uh, people in need, all people in need. And there could be a, um, uh, an opportunity for people who want to assist in some way to um, donate funds specifically towards housing top-ups for all individuals in need, not just refugees. I think it would be problematic if it was done, just done for refugees. Um, but part of the issue is, um, uh, you know, tax receipts and, and that kind you know, CRA um, involvement in this as well. But those are stopgap measures until you can actually deal longer term with supply, which is a much, much bigger issue. But how many of our, of our um, housing opportunities are now uh, Airbnbs? You know, how many of them are, are vacant? Um, and I know that there is, you know, at the municipal level, Michael will know this better than I, there are some um, things that are be done, being done to make sure that housing is used and doesn't sit empty or is not used, you know, for, uh, for high-priced short-term stays rather than ongoing um, housing. But why are we building, you know, 500 square foot condos everywhere um, and not, um, you know, housing that's affordable and housing for, for family. What are we going to do in Calgary and Toronto with all those office buildings that may remain empty for a long time with more people working from home rather than working in these big buildings? Is anybody thinking about whether some of those buildings can be used, can be transformed into mixed use buildings, which would also include affordable housing. I mean, I think we have to get really um, uh, creative about Nate, what we do. Yeah, I mean, I'd just like to chime in two quick points on that. I read an interesting stat that 30% of housing stock in Canada is in the hands of multiple property owners. I think the person who wrote that article um, tag that as parasitic investors, but it does speak to the need for a broader legislative agenda that deals with the housing stock and who owns it. Second quick point, Madeline, you'll recall, we had conceived of an interesting idea uh, that we attempted to do in Kingston that if you're gonna build co-op housing and build affordable housing and you've got newcomers who need to finish their licensure and registration, wouldn't it be interesting through community benefits agreements and municipally sponsored uh, social procurement policies that said that the buildings, the creation of that housing stock is going to have X percentage of newcomers that are literally involved in the design, the architecture, the electrical, the plumbing, they get their licensure and they build their house and their home in the community. Just an idea, funders. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. And, uh, you know, I want to I add to the, this response because I think when we talk, you know, we know what the issues are, supply, affordability, racism, sexism, discrimination in, in, the, in the market. And I think that there's an opportunity also in terms we have legislation that determines how the relationship between a landlord and tenant is supposed to play out in it. And, but there's nothing that protects would-be tenants. And there's a lack of enforcement um, of the, the rules that exist. So I think there are some real policy opportunities to protect tenants and would-be tenants when we know that that those who own the properties, you know, there's 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 it's it's a big profit game, um, and so there needs to be some space for for safety in that. Um, we're running out of time, but we have so many questions to ask. So I'm going to go to to one final question, um, which comes up, you know, maybe at least at every conference, if not in every session, because it's it's such an important issue to our communities, and we've already heard a little bit. Uh, in the panel today about temporary resident to permanent resident uh, transitions and some of the, the challenges we've seen with, with the policies that have existed. 
And so, so the question is, what can we do uh, to convince the federal government to introduce a broad and inclusive immigration status regularization program? Recent programs have excluded workers in low-skilled jobs and excluded non-workers. We can do better. And what is your strategic advice for us as a sector? The, the floor is open. If I may start, Madeline, I think it's important to look at the importance of building coalitions with different communities and different migrant organizations, as well as labor unions and um, sympathetic policymakers, as well as uh, politicians. Every improvement to migrant care worker policies were implemented after migrant care workers formed alliances with other stakeholder groups. I'm using that as an example, right? Migrant care workers were not given the right to apply for permanent residency until uh, there were some 1977 Jamaican mothers, which basically entailed these women forming coalitions with a broad swath of society. And that's how the right to permanent residency got given to migrant care workers. So in answer to this fantastic question, I would say you are OCASI, you are part of OCASI, you are a big network, form coalitions, talk to your MPs, write your MPs, you are essential, you know, you're essential service providers. You understand the lived experiences of migrants. So, you know, mobilize and talk and go to consultations and really highlight uh, the need for a, a federal regularization policy. Uh, you're the ones with the power here. And honestly, I wish I'd gone to other panels to learn more from the wealth of knowledge of this conference as well. Thank you, Ethel. Naomi, and then Carl. Carl, you go first. I'll go after you. Thanks, uh, Naomi. I, you know, I'm I'm reminded of some interactions that I was fortunate to have during some of my international work with countries like Brazil, countries that had. Um, experimented with uh, amnesty programs or regularization programs. And this is more from the what's achievable as opposed to um, the bold, what would be the uh, ideal thing to do. So um, amnesty programs that are time limited, amnesty programs that encourage people to come forward in a, a, a protected fashion, um, and that they might declare, a, produce a declaration or an affidavit that said, I've committed no crimes. You know, I have uh, I have not gained the 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 tax system or the benefit system, or if I did, I might accept a monetary penalty that's associated with that. But the key thing here is to also take a look at who are these communities of people who ended up in an undocumented situation. Was it of their own doing, or was it because of the system? Okay, and in 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 in, in my work with the Congress, for example, we found that. Quite often, it was employers who took advantage of people's vulnerability and then profited from the ability to pay those people at low cost. So if you're going to go down a, a, an administrative penalty component of an amnesty program, don't rest it on the backs of that undocumented person alone. Take a look at the sector that may have profited from the violation of that person's vulnerability. So those are just some, some quick thoughts from policymakers in different countries that had experimented with um, more achievable efforts, politically speaking. Um, in in um, uh, a long time ago, I was a federal civil servant and I worked in the immigration department for uh, 12 years um, before I moved to the province. And when I worked for the federal government, there were regular regularization programs. And we could almost set our clocks on, you know, every seven years or so, there would be a regularization um, program for undocumented people. And it was exactly as Carl described it. Um, people came forward, uh, people were uh, given the opportunity providing that they had not conducted any criminal activity or, you know, they had kept their noses clean, so to speak, and, and worked hard and, and, as we know, most people fall into that category. Um, and they did transition to permanent um, residency and legal status in Canada. Um, there is evidence that it worked. 
you know, it was a useful uh, thing to do. Um, uh, it stopped. Um, I can't tell you how many times when I was the Deputy Minister of Immigration in the province of Ontario um, uh, that consideration was being given to um, Ontario um, either advocating for this with the federal government or in fact including as part of a provincial nominee program, a regularization program. Um, you will know, and Ken, this is before your time, but the construction sector was very, very keen on having a regularization program and had construction employers and the construction unions working together to advocate for a regularization program specifically for that sector because they recognized that many of their employees were undocumented and they wanted to regularize them. So it is, um, and such a program existed. So there are, um, there, are, there are precedents and it is purely a matter of political will and purely a matter of um, uh, it being a multi-stakeholder, definitely including employers and labor, as well as advocacy organizations and settlement organizations and immigrant advocacy organizations. It cannot just be the Ocasis of the world. Um, it really does have to be a multi-stakeholder um, approach demonstrating the, um, the need for a program like this. Um, otherwise, it will not happen and, and it might be very, very difficult to come about in any case. But there, there have always been these conversations um, and it is not a forbidden topic. Um, but it does need real multi-stakeholder involvement. Madeline, I know we're almost out of, out of time, but uh, wanted to, so Naomi, thanks for that and context uh, in terms of the construction industry. I, I think the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program is a bit of a gem. Like it's, it's really, it's done innovative work. Uh, it's really versatile. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, we're the leading province um, partnering with the federal government on the Economic Mobilities Pathways pilot project, which is a alternative pathway for refugees to come in through economic immigrant pathways rather than going through the, the, the incredible time and cost it takes to go through you know, regular refugee pathways. So we can use this program in ways that, that, are, that are different. And we also bring in lots of truckers and personal support workers, but nowhere near the number of, of people that we'd like, international students, another category where people are here on, on temporary um, uh, visas, and we would love to retain these individuals, have them kind of put down roots in Ontario, but the program's not big enough to accommodate the entire uh, entirety of demand. So um, again, just my pitch to people who want to join our chorus of, of asking the federal government to grow the, grow the program, we can complement federal efforts. Federal efforts are to bring in high human capital, great. But like I said before, and, and as Naomi and others have said, the Ontario economy is broad. And this distinction between high skill and low skill is, is so artificial. I was once meeting with an agricultural company saying, if you wanna see low skilled, put me on a farm. I'll show you low skilled. Like it's, we have to value the different types of jobs that are meaningful and important in Ontario and find ways to attract and retain those individuals to be in Ontario. Thanks. I would love, Ken, for the EMPP to be used very extensively with the Afghan movement. Um, mm -hmm. I, think, I think we should talk about, about that because I think it has huge potential. Well, it sounds like we've got really our work cut out for us. Um, we, we're, we've run out of time, so I want to thank our panelists, Carl, Michael, Ken, Ethel, Naomi, for your brilliant insights. You've given us so much to think about and, and I hope some connections that will lead to um, stronger policy, stronger advocacy, coalitions, um, and learning from our, from our experiences in the past. Uh, wishing all participants more learning to come and my congratulations to the OCASI team on a, on a wonderfully put together um, professional development conference.
thank you all for being here and uh, be well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline, for great moderating. Thank you to our panelists, Naomi, Carl, Ken, Ethel, who am I missing? Michael, where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> and Michael, uh, thank you for all the questions coming from our participants and the audience. So much discussion to be had. Thank you all. Have a great lunchtime and we will see you back here in plenary this afternoon. Have a wonderful, wonderful Friday afternoon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. And make sure you uh, stand up. I stood up, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I carried my phone so I can count my steps. <laughs> oh, thank you. Have a great lunchtime. Thank you all so much. Great discussion. <laughs>